I have a challenge for you. I want to colour the dots in this shape so that any two dots that are connected by a line have different colours. I also want you to use the smallest number of colours possible. So for instance, if I colour the dots like this, we can check that no two dots that are connected by a line have the same colour. So this is a valid colouring which uses six colours. But is six the smallest number of colours we could use? Hi, I'm Beth and today we're going to be talking about vertex colourings. These shapes that we're working with are called graphs. These dots are called the vertices and the lines are the edges. For some graphs, it's fairly straightforward to work out what the minimum number of colours needed are so that no two vertices of the same colour are connected. In this first graph, no two vertices are connected by an edge at all, so we can colour all the vertices the same colour. So we only need one colour to colour the graph in this instance. How about this graph? Can we colour this with just one colour as well? Well, if we did that, then say these two vertices would have the same colour and they can't because they're connected by an edge. So we certainly need more than one colour. So let's make this vertex a different colour. The same argument applies here. This vertex and this vertex are connected by an edge, so we're going to have to give it a different colour. But we could use the same colour as over here. So let's give this one green as well. Now, this one can't be green because it's connected to these two, but it could be pink. So let's make this one pink. This is a valid colouring. All the pairs of vertices connected by edges have different colours. So a colouring is possible with two colours, but it wasn't possible with one. So that means the smallest number of colours needed to colour this graph is two. How about this graph? Well, we certainly can't colour it with just one colour for the same reason as before. But can we do it with two colours? Well, let's make these two vertices connected to our first one different colours to the first vertex. Now let's see what happens if we keep doing what we did here. In the previous graph, we just kept alternating the colours. If we do that here, we see we get a colour clash. If I colour this one orange, this one can't be orange or purple because it's connected to one of each of those colours. So it's impossible to colour this graph with just two colours. But if we make this final vertex a third colour, we see this is a correct colouring. No two vertices sharing an edge have the same colour. So the minimum number of colours needed in this case is three. How about this graph? In this graph, every vertex is joined to every other. So if you look at this vertex, it's got three edges coming from it, connecting to the other three vertices. And that's true of all of them. But that means no two vertices can have the same colour on this graph. If any pair of vertices have the same colour, they're connected by an edge. This one and this one, connected by an edge, and same goes here. So that means every single vertex on this graph needs its own colour. So the minimum number of colours needed in this case is four. In fact, graphs like these have a special name. They're called complete graphs because every single vertex has a complete set of connections to every other vertex. We can have complete graphs of any number of vertices. So this is the complete graph on three vertices, this one with five and this one with eight. And in each case, every single vertex is connected to every other vertex in that graph. By the same reasoning as before, because every vertex is connected to every other one, every vertex in each of these graphs needs its own colour. So that means the minimum number of colours needed for this one is three, for this one five, and this one eight. What can we say about more general graphs? Well, as soon as you have an edge in your graph, you need at least two colours, as the vertices at each end need to be different. So the only possibility for the minimum number of colours being one is when there are no edges connecting any vertices, like these graphs. These graphs are called empty graphs as there are no edges. So if it's not an empty graph, then we need at least two colours. Now take a look at this graph. This graph contains a complete graph. This is the complete graph on five vertices. We saw that in order to colour the vertices of a complete graph, we need a different colour for every single vertex. This is true also if the graph contains a complete graph. If any two of these vertices in this subgraph were the same colour, we'd have a problem because they'd be connected by an edge. And this is true more generally. In any graph, if you find a complete subgraph inside it, then we need at least the number of colours that are required to colour that complete subgraph. This is in fact a really useful tool when considering any graph. Find any complete subgraphs and use those as a starting point. So we now know some things about graph colouring. We know we need at least two colours if it's not an empty graph. Also, the number of colours needed is at least the number of vertices involved in the largest complete subgraph. 
So we have some ideas for a minimum bound for the number of colours needed. What about a maximum bound? Every vertex in a graph has something called a degree. These are the number of edges sticking out of it. So in the case of this vertex, it's got degree three, as there are one, two, three edges coming out of it. Every graph has a maximum degree. This is the largest value of a degree for any vertex in the graph. These two vertices have degree four, and no other vertex has a degree bigger than that. So the maximum degree across this graph is four. Let's imagine colouring a general graph. Let n be the maximum degree of the graph plus one. Can we colour our imaginary graph using n colours? Let's start by colouring any vertex. This can be any colour because it's the first one. Now let's colour another vertex in the graph. Either it's connected to the first one and needs a second colour, or it's not connected to the first one, so it can receive the same colour. Let's start this process. Let's say I pick this vertex over here. It's not connected to the first one, so it can receive the same colour. Let's pick another vertex. Let's say I pick this one. This is connected to one with the first colour, so it needs a new one. Now imagine we've done this for a few vertices and now we're colouring another one. The worst possible scenario that we can encounter here is that all the vertices that this vertex is connected to have already received a colour and all of those colours are different. So the maximum number of forbidden colours for this vertex is the degree of the vertex. But that's okay because the degree of this vertex is less than or equal to the maximum degree of the graph. And so as n, the number of colours we're using, equals the maximum degree of the graph plus one, we have at least one more colour we can use to colour this vertex correctly. We can continue like this for each vertex in the graph. Each vertex will have a colour from the n available that we can use. So we can colour any graph with n colours, where n is the maximum degree across the graph plus one. So we have an upper bound. Let's take stock of what we know. The minimum number of colours needed is at least two, unless it's an empty graph when it's one, at least the number of vertices involved in the largest complete subgraph, and it's at most the maximum degree of the graph plus one. Does this help us? Let's return to our first graph. At the start of the video, we found a colouring using six colours. Was this the fewest colours needed? Well, let's look at point three first. We know the number of colours needed is at most the maximum degree of the graph plus one. Let's find the maximum degree of this graph. We can see the maximum degree is four. So point three tells us that we need at most the maximum degree of the graph plus one. So we can do better. We've done six colours, but this tells us we need at most five. And that's not too hard to see. For instance, if we swap the purple vertex with a pink one, then we still have a valid colouring and we're only using five colours now. But now is five the minimum or can we do better than five? Let's look at the other things we've learnt. So certainly we need at least two colours because we have an edge. And point two says we need at least the number of vertices involved in the largest complete subgraph. Well, we can see that we've got a complete subgraph of size four here. All four vertices here are joined to each other. So each of those must receive a different colour. So we definitely need at least four colours to colour this graph. So the minimum number of colours needed is either four or five. It's at least four and it's at most five. So it's either one of those. If we can spot a colouring with four colours, then we know this is the answer. Four will be the minimum number needed. So at this point, a bit of trial and error will help us as we only have two possibilities. Can we colour this with just four colours? And if I spend a bit of time thinking about it, yes, we can. Let me change this green one up for a blue one. This is now a valid colouring with four colours. So we have found and proven that the minimum number of colours needed to colour our graph is four. So we've made some good progress with our vertex colouring problem, but unfortunately our facts alone might not help us find the minimum number of colours needed for every graph. In fact, this number that we've been trying to find, the minimum number of colours needed, has a special name. It's called the chromatic number of a graph. And in general, finding the chromatic number of a graph is a really difficult problem. There are some more tools we can use to help us. So we found a maximum bound for the chromatic number, and we found that as being the maximum degree of the graph plus one. But there's another theorem out there called Brooks theorem, which says, actually, it's slightly better than that. In almost all cases, the chromatic number of a graph 
is less than or equal to the maximum degree of the graph. So it's one better for most cases. The only exception are complete graphs and odd cycles. And in those cases, the chromatic number is that upper bound we found, the maximum degree of the graph plus one. Now you might be thinking, why do we care about the chromatic number of a graph? Well, perhaps you've heard of the four color map theorem. This says that in any map, we can color each country so that no two neighboring countries share the same color using at most four colors across the map. This sounds quite similar to what we've been talking about, except with vertices replaced with countries and edges replaced with borders. And there's a reason for that. If we replace each country with a dot and connect the dots when their respective countries share a border, we can see this becomes a graph colouring question. If we can colour the vertices so no two vertices sharing an edge have the same colour, then we'll have proved the four colour map theorem. So this is very similar to the problem that we were investigating, except you might notice with these graphs created by maps, none of the edges overlap, whereas in the graphs we were looking at, the edges could overlap. So while these are related problems, they have some subtle differences. The four color map theorem turned out to be a really tricky problem and was only proved in 1976 and actually used computers to do a lot of the work. But it's interesting to note the similarities between map colorings and vertex colorings. So what started out as a little bit of fun with colored dots turns out to be the foundation of what was one of the biggest unsolved maths problems for over a hundred years. It just goes to show that the simplest math problems can sometimes be the hardest to solve. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to see more aesthetic mathy videos, do check out my channel and subscribe.